cover today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Debbie Martin. I'm your current treasurer uh, here at the association. And I'm here today um, to welcome all of you to the Bank of King Cod's Flood Seminar. Obviously, this is a topic that's terribly important to all of us. It couldn't be more relevant or more time sensitive. We're very lucky that uh, the Bank of Cape Cod was willing to put this on today and serve you all lunch. I think that deserves a round of applause. Um, your host today is Dante DeMassa. Dante is the Vice President of Residential Lending at the Bank of Cape Cod. He has over 25 years of experience in residential lending. And most importantly, Dante has a home on Mount Vinda that's going to be in the new flood zone. <laughs> so please help me welcome Dante DeMassa from the Bank of Cape Cod. Thank you. Good afternoon. The Bigger Waters um, ins Flood Insurance Reform Act uh, is upon us, and it is going to have an effect on the market. And I think being out with talking to a lot of you, um, the impact I don't think is understood by consumers, sellers. So I thought, you know, the government's view <laughs> is, <laughs> is that Fenway Park is going to be flooded. So we're here to talk about that. A couple of inaccuracies in this picture, Mandy would never get involved, um, but I thought it was appropriate. But that is the view of what's going to happen, and we have a panel of experts that have helped navigate us through this, this issue. When I was trying to figure out how to put this in perspective, I was reading some quotes, and a member of Congress wrote one that I think is appropriate, and it says, since the law was enacted, we have seen a slew of confusion in FEMA mapping. In addition, many families now face increased costs and make home ownership so expensive they would be forced out of their homes or find it impossible to sell. This is unacceptable. I am committing to fixing unattended consequences. Unattended consequences are you, me, our clients, consumers, their families, and the impact it's going to have onto them. And the person that said this was Maxine Waters, who wrote the act, um, which is, I think, very appropriate. They passed the law, and now, sorry, and now we're going to figure out what the consequence is of this law. So we assembled again, as I said, a panel, a panel of experts that are going to help us um, navigate and understand how this relates to us. How does it relate to when you talk to a potential seller or buyer? What do they need to know? What impact is it going to have on them? And in order to do that, we brought some very uh, extinguished and experienced guests. The first person that I want to introduce is Douglas McDonald. Douglas is president and CEO of Murray McDonald, founded in 1971, or as Douglas wanted me to say, a few years ago. Um, he is a certified risk manager, uh, chartered property and casualty underwriter. He's married to Maria, lives in Falmouth, has four children, and is the director of the Cape Cod Sympathy Orchestra. We have Michael Fabiano. Michael is the managing partner and CEO of High Point Engineering. Uh, they're a full service civil, uh, civil engineering and consulting firm. We have Ralph Cataldo. Uh, president of Cataldo Custom Builders, 25 years of building experience. Uh, 2011, Ralph's uh, company was selected by Builder Magazine as the top small builder in America. Pleased to have him. We have Richard Morris uh, of Morris & Newell. Uh, Richard has been in, uh, on Cape Cod uh, practicing since 1970-something. We'll leave it at that. And he's the most avid Red Sox fan that, that I know. Um, at the Bank of Cape Cod, I'd like to introduce some of our folks. Uh, where's Mr. Tom? Tim? Is he here? Tim. Where is everybody? So, President and CEO of the Bank of Cape Cod. Keely Scales uh, is our mortgage underwriter. Proof that mortgage underwriters are people. Uh, Carol Cook. Where's Carol Cook? Carol uh, is one of our mortgage loan officers, and she uh, works out of our Osterville office. And we have Kelly Benway, she works out of the Falmouth office. And Charlie DeSimone, is Charlie still here? Charlie is a senior VP and our commercial lender. 
So we thank you for the opportunity to put this on. We hope it's informative. Uh, before I hand it over to Doug, what we're going to do is we're going to do our presentation, and then I'd ask that you hold your questions until the end. We're going to have a Q&A. We're going to put the panel of experts up, and you can ask any question you want. But I think you will find that the subsequent presentations may answer a lot of what's on your mind. So thank you, and I will turn it over to Doug. Well, good afternoon, everyone. is a, uh, a well-known philosopher and historian. His name is George Santayana. Does anybody know what he it was uh, noted for quoting? People repeat it often. Destined to repeat history. You're destined to re repeat history. That's right. Those who ignore history are destined to repeat it. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about how did we get here? Uh, you know, talking about coastal construction prior to the establishment of the National Flood Insurance Plan. You know, if you look at Cape Cod, I'm going to show you some aerial photos of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way up. You'd find that a lot of the houses that were built along the coast were smaller. They primarily were not bank financed. And those houses that were larger were built by people who were affluent and had money to just put a piece of property together. Um, Flood insurance was minimally available at that time. What the problem ended up happening is that uh, when floods did occur, government agencies were forced to respond, whether it be a local municipality or the state, federal government. They were forced to respond and come up with money and, and uh, help put people's lives back together. You hear a lot of times, you know, this was a... a uh, a disaster area was declared, which made it eligible for low-cost loans. The process was expensive. Some of you may recall the 1960s was one of the worst decades for hurricanes. Some of these names may ring bells to you put up there. Uh, but they were, it was a very destructive decade. It called the Hill to Bet City, the Lower Camille, which was in 69. Um, some of these had gone inland quite a bit and had a wide swath of damage. But basically what happened in 1965, and I think about dollars back then, it was the first billion dollar hurricane to hit. And um, Congress then had ordered the Army Corps of Engineers to build this massive flood protection system for New Orleans, which uh, many of you heard when Hurricane Katrina happened in 2005, was compromised and a lot of it gave way and we had uh, the flood results with Hurricane Katrina. It's just a photo of it there. Uh, some of the damage that was done. But most of you who have driven around Cape Cod, you'll see that the older homes were smaller. And uh, if somebody was to build or buy a property, typically the financing occurred by putting a mortgage on your primary residence. Banks did not like lending to properties that were in high-risk areas. That's Hurricane Camille. I'll just give you an idea of some of the, the damage. I've got to show a before and after picture to give you an idea. You know, most of you folks have all seen those types of slides. Here, here's another picture of a before and after of a church uh, and, and what happened after the hurricane. So there you have the problem. You have a lot of properties that are not insured. I mean, people think about buying insurance. With you, when you buy an insurance policy, it does not cover you for flood. It also doesn't cover you for earthquake. A lot of times people think that uh, those two perils are covered. And no private insurance company was willing to come out and provide flood because they felt it was uninsurable. The risk exposure was just too great. Couldn't do anything about it. So they petitioned the federal government and they looked for some help on that. The federal government's response to the problem was, we'll come up with a uh, national flood insurance plan. So they passed the act in 1968. I think it's important that you understand what a flood is. Being in my line of business, a lot of times people call me up and say, my house was flooded. What happened? Well, the uh, washing machine hose burst and flooded out my basin. Well, that's not a flood by the National Flood Insurance Program definition. Uh, in fact, a little risk management advice here. If you have those rubber hoses, get rid of them. Uh, get those uh, high quality, some of them are, uh, you see, they're kind of like, armor coated in steel uh, hoses, you pay up more claims on those than you can imagine. 
One other little tip about a flood, people go away on vacation and they sometimes forget to turn the water off in their basement. And uh, what will happen sometimes is that uh, in the winter time, the house may freeze, the water is not turned off, and they come back to a basement full of water. That again is not a flood. A little tip, when you go away on vacation, just turn the water off in your basement. So the Flood Insurance Act was passed in 1968. They gave communities uh, some time to establish, uh, to adopt the established flood maps. Falmouth was one of the first ones on Cape Cod, and this just shows you some of the towns. But 1974 is a big date when it comes to the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, you can say, if, I, if you take one thing away from this conversation today with regard to insurance, the houses that were built prior to 1974 are the houses that are going to be impacted the greatest overall with the change that's going on. And the reason why we call those houses they're built before the establishment of flood insurance rate maps. DOC refers to date of construction. So what was the date of construction of the home? It was built before 1974. Again, I'm just using a date there for you. Uh, there's a, they refer to that as pre-firm. It was built before the establishment of flood insurance rate maps. And the legislators got together and they thought, how can we um, charge these people who already had homes in these flood zones a high premium for their insurance? Because a lot of these houses were built at a low elevation. For those of you who have gone through a uh, part of the coastal area and seen that some of the houses that were flooded out, the last one we had, in uh, the Hurricane Bob in 1991, you saw some of those houses were rebuilt on stilts, but that was to make them in compliance with the uh, National Flood Insurance Plan. Those houses that were built prior to 1974, the government allowed them to have what we refer to as subsidized flood insurance rates. Their exposure does not meet the risk. And those are the homes that you see along the coast when the flight comes and you get a you know, 10, 15, 20 foot tidal surge are the most adversely impacted. Those homes also didn't need to have a flood elevation certificate. And Mike's going to talk about elevation certificates in his presentation, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. But I do want you to know that before 1974, you did not need an elevation certificate. Any of those houses built after 1974, they needed an elevation certificate. Anybody have an idea why? They require that? Good. Journal where you were in the flood zone. Exactly. They wanted to know where you were in the flood zone. As simple as that. And how high were you above what they refer to as the base flood elevation. So any new construction that took place after 1974 was referred to as post flood. And uh, they had some basic requirements there. You had to meet a certain height above sea level. They call it a base flood elevation. And then, to determine that, they required the flood elevation certificates. Some of the problems you had, though, on the flood maps back then, and I need to show you a panel. This is what one of the flood maps looked like. And uh, if, if, you re if you refer to it, it doesn't have a lot of detail on it. And it was sometimes difficult to find where a piece of property was in conjunction to the flood zone you were in. And the flood elevation certificate helped to do that. If you had a house that was one foot in the flood zone, uh, they put your entire house in the flood zone. This gives you an idea. This flood map, I just circled it for you. It's uh, May 18, 1973. And it talks about the, the boundaries. But some of the challenges that you had there is that these flood maps, they uh, lack of detail. They were difficult to locate properties. There were few roads, no new structures. It was a uh, problem that a lot of errors. In fact, uh, when Hurricane Katrina came along, they found that a lot of those properties that were there were not properly rated. Surprise, surprise. Uh, there were a lot of shenanigans that had gone on. And they realized that they needed to do something about this. One of the issues with uh, flood insurance, we talk in the insurance industry with large, large numbers. The federal government wanted to make sure that they had the ability to get a lot of people into the flood program that they created because they figured the more people they had in there, not all of them were going to get flooded, but the more people that they had into the program, the greater premium they, they would be able to collect and the more solid it would be. They did not want taxpayers funding it. Act 
happened in the Gemachi was it, it, it referred to as a special flood hazard area. And uh, whether you fell into a special flood hazard area or not determined whether you had to buy flood insurance if you had a federally backed mortgage. <coughs> Interesting fact to know that one third of all flood disaster assistance people are people without flood insurance. In fact, people outside of high risk areas, they file over 20% of the flood claims. Anybody have an idea if you also have a high flood area why you might file a flood claim? If they get torrential downpours and somebody says, man, we got 18 inches of rain in the last 24 hours, you're not near the coast, you're not near a river where you have what they call water runoff. And so getting back to the definition they talk about flood insurance, it had to be where you have two more properties in an area, two more acres, or two more properties that were flooded. So it just couldn't be your own house that was flooded. So people that were in a, uh, what you might call a low flood zone could still be flooded. In fact, uh, all of Cape Cod is in a flood zone. People call me up and ask, you know, am I in a flood zone? Yeah. I live at 175 feet above sea level. I am in a flood zone. We're in trouble, though, if I'm flooded. But we're all in flood zones, and it depends what area you're in. So, <clears throat> unintended consequences. I think the federal government created its own problem. If you think about it, the flood is... If the, flood, if the federal government had never come up with flood insurance, people would not have built as many houses as they did near the coast. All of a sudden, after 1974, if you looked at those aerial photographs, you started to see that the coast started to get built up quite a bit. And in fact, the houses got bigger. And people talk about uh, McMansion homes on, along the coast. Uh, the industry really was uh, not aware of what had happened until one big incident happened in 1992 uh, down in Florida. Hurricane Andrew, homestead. Uh, you had this tremendous hurricane blow across the southern part of Florida, and the industry started to wake up. And this is the, what I'm going to talk about, the private industry woke up and said, oh my gosh, we have a major problem on our hands. We have built all these properties along the coast. What if that hit Miami? What would it have done to us? And there's two issues we talk about when it comes to uh, insurance. There's wind damage and there's flood damage. A lot of times people will say, well, you know, I'm not, in a, I'm not near the coast, but you're still susceptible to having a lot of damage from a hurricane. So there's wind damage. But when Hurricane Andrew came by, $26 billion of property damage, mostly wind caused, but the property casualty industry reacted pretty adversely to it. And they begin to withdraw from coastal communities. You may recall in the early, I think it was around 2004, the Andover companies, which insured over 15,000 homes on Cape Cod, made a decision that we are terminating all those homeowner policies and we're pulling off the Cape. And uh, an insurance company that nobody really heard of called the Fair Plan started becoming common vernacular. And people didn't want to go into the Fair Plan, but there was no other option because insurance companies, they figured they didn't have what's called the spread of risk. They didn't have uh, they have it too heavily concentrated on Cape Cod and the rating agencies. We use AM Best, some of you might have heard of Standard Poor's, uh, Moody's. They started to tell the insurance companies if you get too much exposure in the, along the coast, we're going to downgrade your rating. And they were afraid of that, so they began to pull off the Cape Cod. And we started having to use the Andover company. The Andover companies, when they pulled off the side, they used, used the fair plan. So there's a difference between flood and wind. And what we're talking about here is flood, but the important point to take away from here is uh, the National Flood Insurance Plan was very slow to react. They really didn't do much about it. They see that there's a problem on the hand. The private industry had uh, jumped on the bandwagon first to be able to control some of their exposures. They get a picture of Hurricane Andrew. By the time 2005 came along, that was a terrible year for hurricanes. As you may recall, we had five of them out there. There's over $100 billion in damages. You had Dennis, Emily, Katrina, Peter, and Wilma. But there's rapid fire one after the other. People started talking about global warming and the impact that uh, El Nino and all these other uh, uh, current wind events and uh, are going to do to the coastal underwriting. And insurance companies really began to uh, further withdraw from the marketplace but the federal government was left holding the bag. Uh, it ended up causing our, our greatest challenge in terms of the financial viability of the flight insurance program. They realized with Katrina, 
a lot of the properties weren't insured. If you look at Mississippi, uh, so many of the properties weren't insured. Weren't insured. The, the governor of Mississippi did something that uh, might have won him votes, but it was actually real un-American. He turned around and said, all you homeowner insurance companies, you need to pay for flood damage. Uh, for these houses that were destroyed by flood because we think it was probably caused by wind first and then flood afterwards. And uh, a number of the insurance companies took them to court and said, you can't do that. We, we have a contract and we're excluding flood. You can't force us to pay flood. We never charged them for the premium of it. Went to court and it was overturned. Uh, and they realized they, they had an issue on it. And the, the National Flood Insurance Program was in debt about $30 billion. It's just a huge amount of money. And uh, they began to re-underwrite their book of business. And when they say re-underwrite, what that means is they started to look at all the risks that they had on the books. And they realized that a lot of the flood insurance rate maps were inadequate. They were, they were built in 1973. Every year when you take a look at the coast, I mean, if you go down to Chatham and you look at Guantanamo Point, those are familiar through voting out there, you see how that changes year to year, right? Starting with the rip, well, the same thing has happened up and down the coast. A lot of this, the ERB has, has moved in the flood maps on kept up with it. A lot of new developments were put in, new houses were built, and they realized they needed to make some changes to it. One of the biggest issues, though, again, a lot of people not buying flood insurance. And when disasters happen, they just figure, you know what? Federal government's going to bail me out. I don't have to worry about it. And these are the people that may not have a mortgage, but still didn't buy the flood insurance. So uh, those are just some of the challenges there. Bottom line is the rates were inadequate for any of those houses that were built prior to the establishment of flood insurance rate maps. And the federal response was the Bigger Waters Act. Now, I'm quoting another politician, not to make this political, but to, uh, first of all, I mean, sometimes you have to pass the legislation to find out what's in it. I just, I just find it amazing that Maxine Waters, uh, you know, it was like, I can't believe this in her name's on the bill, and now, you know, she's backpedaling trying to fix it because you can imagine how many dots are being pointed at her right now. Um, so, in any event, that was the response. It's where we are. And to keep things at a, uh, an understanding, if you can take away from it, is that the problem is that $30 billion in debt, and they're trying to fix it. And one of the things they're doing is that they pass this legislation and they're looking to get more premium into the program to make it actuarially sound. And again, the biggest impact of people will be those houses that were built prior to 1974. People can talk about some of these flood maps are changing. I understand they're going to change. But if you had your house constructed prior to 1974 and you never did any type of flood mitigation, you're more than likely going to have the greatest impact uh, in terms of the cost structure. A number of provisions there. I don't know how much you want to go into detail on the provisions, but uh, again, they want to make the program financially stable, and they're looking to uh, eliminate pre-firm uh, subsidy. Uh, the, subsidizing the pre-firm rates, and they're starting with secondary homes, so they figured most people that own property on the coast, if you take up, if you look up and down, we use Cape Cod as an example, most coastal properties uh, that exist here are by secondary homeowners. And they figured they're the other ones who can afford to pay more, so we're going to charge you more. If you are a primary homeowner, that is your home, you live on the, on, on the coast, uh, they've been more gentle with you in the pricing structure. A couple of dates in terms of the timeline, uh, and I just put this down there, January 1st, 2013, they decided to remove uh, subsidized rates for new policies. And, and then uh, if you had an existing policy as a secondary homeowner, starting October 1, you're going to start seeing your rates go up 25% per year until your rates are actuarially sound. But one of the advice that I gave people is that, you know, get the facts first. Find out what your house base flood elevation is, and you either be getting an elevation certificate because some houses actually were built higher than um, what they gave you credit for. And I'm going to show you some of the pricing, what that looks like. 
I do want to say this. We were down in, uh, a number of people from our agency and from our industry were down in, in uh, seeing that this was coming up back in April, and we had uh, lobbied against this for some great relief. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end uh, with regard to the Bigger Waters Act. So anyway, getting back to the uh, October one, which we went by, you, you see the bullet points up in front of you there. Uh, if you had a, a, a primary home and it's in force, advice, don't lapse it. Because if it was lapsed, you're going to be required to pay full, full rate. Uh, in terms of the uh, new flood insurance rate maps, that's sort of a moving target. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, but June 16, 2014, is uh, when Boswell County is looking to have them adopted by. You've heard some people giving some pushback to it. Um, they're phasing out grandfathering some policies. It's a moving target. I don't want to go into detail on this, but what I do want to show you on this slide is give you an idea. Your subsidized rates, if you look at this, and uh, in fact, this keep it as simple as possible. This is for a house with a quarter million dollars building, which is the maximum amount, hundred thousand dollars in contents, and they're saying you're in a flood zone AE. AE for those of you, that's just a high risk zone. And if your lowest floor was four feet above the flood elevation, you'd have to pay thirty six hundred dollars under the old rates. Under the new rates, it's five hundred and fifty three dollars. So not all rates were going to go up. If your house was above you're actually going to see a raise going down. So that's an interesting point that people aren't aware. The second thing is the lowest uh, floor property is at base flood elevation. Your rates are still go down. Instead of 3,600, you're paying 1,815. So if you are fortuitous enough to have a builder construct your house at the, the new flood maps that you wouldn't have known, uh, at that particular height for whatever reason, your flood rates would have gone down. And if your lowest floor is four feet below, which is more than likely what's going to happen, you're four feet below, you're going to pay $10,700 at four feet below, where you would have paid $3,600. Just give you an idea in terms of the, the pictures uh, that, this, that this paints. Moral of the story here is, um, Make sure your, your house is built sufficiently high enough. And Ralph, from Ralph Catalo Construction, will talk a little about flood mitigation a little bit later on with some of the things you can do. I put a slide up here from the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, just gives you an idea in terms of flood zones, what the pricing looks like when they have the different flood zones. You can see A1 to A30, uh, V1, which is a velocity zone, a little more expensive. But you see the pricing going from $2,600 to $5,500 to $7,600 going up. And a lot of people really can't afford those numbers. And then you have afterwards, if you take a look at it, you see where it says post? You see a house there uh, is $1,584. $388 for preferred risk policy. Just showing that the rates were a lot lower. That's why I want to take away from, from that slide. I had a client... Uh, He's a uh, builder up in the Boston area, and he's going to buy a home in, in Hingham. And he said, Doug, um, my wife really wants to buy this house that's on the water, and I don't want to move. Can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, I understand, and this is back in May, and he said, I understand the, uh, these flood maps are, are uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about them. What's going to happen when I buy this house? Like, you know, the, the beauty of technology today is that you can today go on and you go into a town and you can look up a house and you can go right into the, the website and you can get the property record card and tell you when the house was built or when it was substantially improved. And it says, oh, the house was built in 1949. It was substantially improved in 2004. Substantially improved in this case, it said it was a total gut rehab. According to the flood insurance rate maps, if your house is more than 50% substantially improved, you've got to build your house in compliance with current building code. And that meant you have to elevate the home. Well, this person is a good example of shenanigans. They said it was less than 50% improved. And, and here I am, I'm looking right at the building permit, you know, that's online. And, and I told the gentleman, I said, well, here's the good news and the bad news is. The, the, uh, the bad news is the flood insurance on this is going to cost you 
a year for $250,000 of coverage because it was only three feet above uh, the current high tide mark. And uh, it was nowhere close. I think it was going to have to be at 18 feet above you know, the highest in the base flood elevation. So that was the bad news, $59,000. Anybody know what the good news was? He didn't have to find a house. <laughs> I gave him the information. He said, boy, that, he said, you were a godsend on that. Thank you very much. Uh, but that was probably one of the worst cases I've seen. I've, I've had to deal a lot with a number of these things lately. Uh, and, and one of the, the best things you can do when you talk to people, my grandfather was an attorney. He used to say, get the facts first, and then argue with a vengeance. <laughs> Uh, I, I would have to say one of the things you can do is get the facts first. One of the best things you can do is you can get an elevation certificate. Michael will talk a little bit about elevation certificates. But I uh, was working with a local a commercial client that is buying property with somebody who has a lot of prop a number of buildings along the water, and they were not, uh, they were all, he, he, he paid for them, and he could buy flight insurance, and this new person is going to buy, going to be forced to buy flight insurance, and under the new law, it's going to cost them $100,000 just for flight insurance, and it's sort of a deal breaker. You know, you're looking at it, it's like, wow, what can I do? And uh, you know, part of the issue is he's not looking at contacting some builders about, okay, what's it going to cost me to raise this up, and can I pass these costs on to the consumer of my business? So the impact uh, to you is, uh, you know, uh, you need to get elevation certificates. It can impact real estate sales. And, you know, the, the terminology, buyer beware. Uh, you need to let people know what's going on. I know you folks are already aware of that. And you're in tune to that. I don't need to tell you more about that. There is some legislative relief. Um, and I, I'll get back to this map here. Um, there are some mitigation strategies that some business owners and uh, homeowners can, can work with it when they work with their engineer or their builder. You can also work with FEMA. They have some mitigation assistance. I put their web page up there. And I... Uh, just jumping ahead here. Um, this is why I'm jumping ahead. It's just due to time. In terms of mitigation assistance, I put all this together and I uh, found out on Saturday evening that uh, Maxine Waters, the person who this bill is named after, has now gotten some bipartisan support, something you don't see too often in Washington these days. And uh, she has announced that there's a, looking for a legislative fix for the National Flood Insurance Plan. And they're talking about a possible four year delay to the program and rate increases. That's not passed. Today we still have to deal with the facts of what we're dealing with today. So when houses buy, uh, uh, when houses sell today, we still have to deal with the rules that are in place, but it looks like they're moving in the right direction. But this is going to take a while. The new legislation is proposed, it, it proposed that FEMA utilize the NFIP funds to reimburse policyholders if they need to appeal a MAP determination. Because sometimes the MAP determinations are incorrect. And again, Michael talked a little bit about that. And uh, a lot of this stuff here, Michael, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. But they're, they're going to, uh, I think they've listened a lot to their constituents and they're going to make some change. But they, you're still going to see at the end of this process that there's going to be a move toward having people elevate their properties to get them out of high risk flood areas and make them less susceptible to damages. To make this a little bit easier for you, I know I went through things here pretty quickly, but I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to put together a, um, a website. You can access it on your mobile phone right now if you want. It's called riskadvice.com forward slash flood. If you click that on, there's a number of resources that are available that will tell you. You'll be able to click on a flood map, see if a piece of property is located in a flood area. Uh, gives a lot of information in terms of um, what, what, what I just talked about here today. Again, I went through this relatively quickly at a 30,000 foot level. Let you know why we're here. The government is $30 million in debt. What's their solution to it? have this act put up on us? And uh, there are going to be some changes coming down the pipeline. But you can access that and uh, you can also there's the contact information for each presenter.